Welcome to the Sports Trading Card Hall of Fame. Today I want to talk about unquestionably the most famous person in the history of sports cards, and that's Dr. James Beckett. If you want to talk about a player who is really important to cards, there are a number of players to look at, but actually people inside the, the history of cards, that's only, really only Dr. James Beckett stands at that level. And that's really what I, what I wanted to be looking at, but I wanted to be looking more at why he became so iconic. What was so important about why he was important? And so to look at that, I got to talk really about what life was like for the, the card collectors of the most important period of time in the history of sports cards, that being the mid 80s into the mid 90s. The reason that era was so important was because it was the right time. It was the perfect time for it to happen. There was a, a different world of, there was a different economic reality in the late 80s. And that opened up the door for, well, okay, so for Gen X, we could easily be viewed as the generation of stuff. But that's not really an appropriate descriptive name. I mean, really, we, we're best known as the awesome generation or the rad generation. Neither of those have really caught on yet. But stuff generation actually applies to a transitional time between two generations. The late Gen X portion of, the, of our generation and then the early stages of millennials. Those two groups grew up in a very particular time of just the way that everything worked for kids was very distinct. It was a time when Toys R Us was at its height. The Saturday morning cartoons had evolved into a very well manicured affair where they were just selling like crazy. There was so much to that era that really defined how we experienced the world because of every, the perfect storm of everything being just right in the mid to late 80s of stuff being created at a level that we hadn't, we'd never seen. And there was an econ economic prosperity that really made that work. And that continued through the better part of the 90s until a whole new world of existence popped up, which was a digital world. We lived in, in an analog world, but a digital world was really coming to its own as the 90s wore on. So for early millennials, they relate very much to the experiences of those of us late Gen X, because there was kind of a, a shared transition Whereas mid to late millennials, they, they grew up in a digital world and they think in a digital world. And the reason that sports cards died off in the late 90s and really remained pretty much dormant up until the COVID bubble was because it, cards weren't right for most millennials and not really for Gen Z either. For us growing up in the, in the analog world of the stuff era, we you know, we had video games and we used the computer from time to time. But for us, when we wanted to look out into the world, we looked at an encyclopedia set or a collection of National Geographics. Those were still our windows into the world. If you traveled, you have all of a sudden expanded your world significantly. But as, as you progressed into the millennial era, there was a, a whole generation of kids who grew up on computers and they just thought through the portal that a computer provided such that when it, the world for them was much broader. Anything they wanted to see and know, they could find it. They just had to go in there, root through and find it, which means that for an ent the better part of a generation, the world was ephemeral. It was inside the box. It wasn't outside. For us, the world was tactile. We went out and we experienced the world. For them, the world was inside the box. They explored it through their own journey without ever having to leave their seat. And when you live in a world where that's, that's your existence, you don't need things. Things don't really make sense entirely because there's too much else to occupy your time. So that means that sports trading cards didn't really have a place for the, the better part of this generation. It just didn't make sense. And so it was really for those of us from this stuff generation era, we were the ones who really hung on to cards and kept the card industry going up until the COVID bubble. So for, for the evolution of cards, it really could have only come at a time when society was ready for cards and society was not ready yet to get distracted. In that window of time, we got to see this incredible time of growth. But that time of growth, like I said, it was analog, which means that we didn't have the... So 
when you live in an analog world, it's a world of mystery and discovery because it's what you can see, it's what you can access, and it's stories that you can hear. But that's basically the limitations. So if you grew up in, in the late 80s and the early 90s, your town had almost guaranteed to have a card shop, unless it's an incredibly small town, you probably had more than one at some point. And you had some close towns nearby and you would go to those different towns and you would engage with those different card shops. And that was your world. Maybe you'd go to the big city or anytime you go on a trip, you'd always be bugging your parents to go visit card shops in this faraway town, which always drove them nuts because you go to the card shop in town, one card shop's like another to them. But what we knew was that in our area, there were only so many cards access accessible and we would exhaust that. And then what do we do afterwards? How in the world do we, how, how in the world do we find the cards that didn't make it into our little cluster? And so we needed a portal to the outside that was what well, we needed multiple portals. That's really what we needed. So the first challenge that we had was just in terms of even before this, we needed two different things. We needed the ability to develop a language. We needed to know what these cards meant and what they were worth. We also needed to know really what was out there. And those two things were fulfilled by Dr. James Beckett's price guides. Now, he wasn't the only person who created price guides. There were a couple out there, but his price guides were the most famous. And he started off, now, was he the first one to create price guides? Was, did he do the best ones? Well, we can debate that for a while, but he created the most iconic price guides. He started off making annual Beckett's. And these were, I mean, they were extremely professional. They were booklets. And so it looked like he was an expert. And that's, that's always a great move if you're going to try to create something that is respected. You gotta make it look like it's supposed to be respected, and he did that. So that meant right from the outset, a Beckett annual looked like it was the obvious place to go for prices. But the Beckett annuals were designed for an early time of card collecting, which was based entirely upon classic cards, old cards. Cards in the early 80s were primarily sold out of stamp and coin shops because that's what they were. They were memorabilia. They were antiques. And so you went to these kinds of shops to get these antiques. And so what he did was he created an annual price guide that gave you the price for all of these cards. But it was an annual price guide because you didn't need any more, any more up-to-date news about the prices of these cards. The player's been retired for probably decades. So what's gonna suddenly change his card value? So as long as you got a year-to-year -year idea of the general trend of the card value, that's really all that you needed. But as you got into the mid to late 80s, things were changing dramatically. We're now a whole new market for, for new players and new cards was emerging. And that means that the activities of these players are, are quickly affecting their card values. I mean, all of a sudden a player becomes an all-star. His card value is gonna shoot up. Another player has a really bad season and everybody loses faith in him. That kind of movement is a lot more frequent. And an annual price guide doesn't work well for that because you get to find out at the end of the year, oh, so all that happened. So he started to create a, a price guide that was monthly. And for the monthly magazine, it was much thinner. It was intended to hit the highlights. So it only looked at the cards that really tended to likely have some interest, up or down. And by truncating it and leaving the others out and just going, well, you know, it's, it's just kind of, we knew that we could always turn to an annual to get the general prices of everything else. And then this gave us an up-to-date look at the trends that the hobby was going through at a more recent pace. And by bridging the gap of those two, that was a critical part of what made a Beckett so important because there were two tiers. There was the long-term tier of everything is in it. And then there was the short-term tier of these are all the things that are going on right now. So for us, we needed to have access to both of these pieces of information and the same name was providing it to us. So that really did help us create kind of a bedrock level of understanding of cards. And like I said, not everybody agreed that the Beckett was the best, but even though there were other people who turned to Sports Collector Digest or they were turned to Tough Stuff or whatever,
it was still understood that the Beckett was the standard bearer, whether others liked it or not, to the ter point that we actually used it as a term. If something, in order to talk about something's price, we say that it Beckett's for this, it Beckett's for that. That was just the, the vernacular that we used. And that was really important for us in this time of the late 80s into the early 90s because we were transitioning as collectors, but our world was evolving too. So like I said, you grew up in a town and you had a couple of card shops. Well, you had that by the early 90s. Earlier than the 90s, you, didn't, you most likely didn't have card shops. So it was difficult to find cards. But whether it was before you had a card shop or after you had a card shop, the most important thing for the card industry at that time was card shows. It was a traveling circus that just traveled all over the country and it spread cards all around. So for you, you grow up in, in a town and the card show may come to your town, it may come to a nearby town, but when it, it comes, you know you're saving your money, you're preparing because you're going to walk in there and it is the same thing that Barnum and Bailey was for a, a generation, a, a century earlier. It was the exotic world coming to your town and you get to experience something that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. So you walk in with your money and you probably would show up with your own cards too because you, you've you exhausted the number of cards you can sell in your town. This gives you an opportunity to sell to a new market. But that, setting aside that and the fact that your cards also are kind of like cash in their own right, you come in excited to find out, are you going to be finding some of those pieces of your checklist that you otherwise can't get and you might not ever get? Are you going to be able to click those off? Are you going to find something you didn't even know existed? So for us, we, we lived for those card shows. They were critical for our ability to function as a card collector because it gave us a broader range. But card shows were still kind of... Um, they were kind of run of the mill. And so it was still this, this nebulous affair where it's just random stuff, random people, everything's still random. We needed to have an icon like Dr. James Beckett to stand over the top of that so that we all could kind of rely on there is a person, maybe not a person in charge, but there is one person that we can all look at and use as that center point to base everything, not just price-wise, but just the whole concept of card collecting, we all knew that that name was this, this integral part of the collecting of collecting that helped all of us in every single sport, every single facet of cards really, really lock in together. And it helped us to feel connected in a way, but it wasn't just for the vibrant aspect of the card industry of prices. It also provi provided another function, at least the annuals did, which is that they worked like an almanac too. They did a great job with the Beckett annuals of putting together pretty much everything you needed to know about cards, not in terms of all the diagnostic information, but they at least told you, they gave you checklists for everything. And then they told you the different inserts and all the different inserts. They gave you a roadmap for all the things you could collect. And this meant that for people like myself, where I'm a pure collector, I'm a true collector, for me, I don't care about the price. Some people may say that we collect, care about prices, but we don't. To us, the price is the annoyance. It's the entry fee. We don't like that it has that price. We just want, the collection exists for its own sake, and we've got to facilitate that collection. We got to fill in the holes. And for us, those of us who don't care about the price guide, it gives us two things. One, it gives us a general idea of what we're looking at in order to get the things that we need to get. But it also gives us the checklist to know what the bounds of our collection, the structure of our collection. We know what we need to pursue and we can look at things that we would like to add to our collection. So for it, it facilitated everybody's needs. It took the, the people who were in, into investments and it gave them a guide. It was for the people who flipped cards. They had an idea of the trends. They knew what to work with, what hidden gems might be sitting there waiting to, to burst forth or you know, all of that. And even for those of us who were just straightforward, pure collectors, we had a place for it too. That Beckett provided a role, did a role for us as well. So 
as the card industry grew through the 1980s and through the 1990s, the Beckett provided us with that backbone and it was critical for it. It really was critical. And it became very symbolic too. The, it, it provided us with a magazine. So the Sports Illustrated subscription was usually the dad subscription. And then the kid usually had the Beckett magazine. It provided us with that. So it was like a starter magazine for us as a, car, as a sports fan as well. But also the covers of the Becketts, they had two covers. They had a player on the front and they had a player on the, on the back in most cases. And that helped us with trends as well. So the Beckett was kind of a, kind of a way of moderating the, the general importance the players had. So you'd ha see a player that was starting to show up on Beckett's, that, that was a cue to you, take this guy serious. So for this entire generation of collectors, this, this was critical for all of us and we defined our presence on it. And then over the years, the importance has kind of faded away a bit as the, the nature of collecting has faded. So the vibrant activities of card collecting that was so big during the junk wax era faded back a bit and it hit kind of a, kind of a lull as we moved into the new millennium. The Beckett itself didn't mean quite as much because we moved into a digital world where not only were the, the interests of people different, but also the way that we experience card, the way that we look things up. Magazines were no longer as significant as they had been just a decade earlier. And so the Beckett was starting to fade into a place where they had to make a major transition. And fortunately for them, they had done a good job of getting into the card grading space. So that helped to create a foundation for their forward movement. But they also had to evolve it into a digital medium, which they've done a pretty good job with it. So they've been able to maintain the Beckett name as a prominent part of the, the hobby. But Dr. James Beckett, well, actually, he separated away from the company and he stands alone on his, he stands as, as his own existence in the hobby as just kind of a voice at this point, which is really kind of cool that he's made this evolution. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the same presence that he once did, but that's because he was critical for a certain period of time where we needed exactly what he provided. And that was so vital for us. So that's the story that I want to talk about with Beckett here in this, in this story. I want to talk about why the Beckett and why his presence, why his image was so important during this time. I will probably talk in the future more about, uh, more about the, both him and the magazines. Um, but in this case, I think I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to cover. So if you, if you're curious about the different kinds of stories that I'm, I'm talking about here in this, uh, in this channel, definitely check them out. Um, subscribe if you haven't done so already and, and yeah, thanks for watching.